Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Studio. My name is Adam, and it's time for another Technique Talk. Thank you so much to our studio VIPs, Carl Spence, Luke Uyamura, thank you. And today's featured studio artist is Sam Kelly. Thank you so much for donating, Sam, and if you want to become a studio artist or VIP, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Adam Tan. Today's episode is about recording the marimba, and a lot of people ask me, how do I record my videos? How do I record my sound tests? Where do I put my mics? What kind of mics do I use? All that sort of stuff. I'm gonna answer all of these questions in this video. There are many reasons why you would wanna record yourself, including auditions, or if you wanna have a portfolio on YouTube, which is a really good idea, I strongly recommend it. Or maybe you're just recording for fun. No matter what your reason is, it's always good to know how to record yourself. Now, this video is just gonna talk about the audio side of recording, not the video side. Um, if you wanna know about the video side, let me know in the comments below. But today I'm just gonna be talking about recording the sound of the marimba. And again, I'm not a professional. I'm not an audio technician. This tutorial is meant to be very, very basic. If you already know how to record marimba, then you should probably stop watching. But otherwise, feel free to join me. <laughs> if you wanna check out stuff that I've recorded before, then just check out any of my mallet reviews on my channel. They're all recorded with this setup that I'm gonna show you today. And again, I don't know everything, but if you like the sound of my videos, this is how to produce it. So the first thing you need to consider is acoustics. Now acoustics are very important. They affect the sound greatly. It's usually to do with the room that you're in. I personally don't really think about things like where exactly to place the microphone in the room or the deadest part in the room, but I just simplify it into wet or dry. A wet space is usually a place like a bathroom or an auditorium or a cathedral, a place that has a lot of reverb. It's either got lots of hard surfaces like tiles or wood, or it's just a really big space. A dry space is a space that usually has a lot of absorbent material on the room, kind of like this acoustic foam behind me. It's usually a smaller room, but if you have a big room with lots of acoustic foam, that's also a dry space. A dry space is a space that usually has no reverb. It's a very clean sound. Now spaces that you usually perform in, like auditoriums and stuff like that. They're usually right in the middle. They're neither fully dry, they're neither fully wet, they're just dread. They're dry enough that you can hear the sound clearly, but they're wet enough that they have a nice reverb for the audience so that it sounds all whoa, washy and stuff. Now, usually when I record videos, whether it's for auditions or for mallet reviews like I do on this channel, I like a drier acoustic. A wet acoustic may sound really fancy when you're there yourself listening to it through your own ears, but when you record it, it's a lot of excess noise and it means you can't really edit it in post. But when it's a drier space, you can compress, you can add reverb, you can add all kinds of effects to it to make it sound fancier in post and there's a lot more wiggle room. So it's definitely better for studio recordings. Now, of course, this is going to vary depending on what your situation is, what you're recording for. But if you're unsure, go for a drier room. Speaking of drier rooms, a lot of people have been asking me about the acoustic foam that I use in my studio. This is basically just eBay acoustic foam that I got for like $70. There's lots of these foam squares that I've glued to the wall because this space is just all brick walls. It's just white brick walls. And when there was no foam on the walls, it was very like noisy. There was a lot of overtones bouncing off the walls. I really didn't like that. So I've got a wall of foam to counteract against that. But anyway, the first consideration you should make, choose your acoustic. The second thing you need to consider is what you're gonna be recording with, which are microphones. Now microphones come in all shapes and sizes. There are like a million models of microphone. The one that I'm using right now, the Rode Video Mic Pro, which is on this camera, you would not use that to record marimba because it's just not the right type of microphone. Now, when you're thinking about buying microphones, there are two main microphones that I consider, dynamic microphones, and condenser microphones. Dynamic microphones are powered microphones. They're powered by themselves. They're usually used for things like karaoke or like live music settings, like live amplification at a concert. Dynamic microphones are usually very rugged. They can take a beating, you can drop them, they'll still work. They're very good for amplifying, but they're not so good at picking up very soft sounds very accurately. They're not so good for studio applications. So I would not use dynamic microphones 
for recording. Condenser microphones need power. They're not powered, they don't have batteries inside them, and they're usually a lot less rugged than dynamic microphones. If you drop a condenser microphone, it's probably not gonna work again. And condenser microphones are not generally used for performance because they're a lot more expensive, and yeah, they're just difficult to work with in a live concert environment. But they're very good for studio recordings because the sound they pick up is very accurate. So for marimba and for percussion in general, definitely I would go towards condenser microphones because dynamic microphones may be cheaper and more convenient, but they sound a lot worse. Now, a big condenser microphone is usually called a large diaphragm microphone. So they're usually much bigger in size. And a smaller microphone is called a small diaphragm microphone. Which one would you use for marimba? Well, most people for marimba will have two small condenser microphones and one large condenser microphone. Now, the main difference between small condensers and large condensers is that they pick up different types of sound. So a large condenser microphone picks up more low frequencies. It's good for things like kick drums, double bass, and low male voices. <laughs> And another thing that people use it for is the bass end of a marimba. Conversely, small condenser microphones are used for warmer, higher sounds like strings, piano, choir. So that means small condenser microphones are pretty good for picking up about 80% of the marimba's sound. Now I personally use these. These are the Behringer C2s and they're a pair of small condensers. You can see how small they are. They're literally like this big, they're, they're tiny. They're fully made of metal, they use XLR, so they have to be powered by an audio interface. More on that later. But these are the microphones that I use for all of my recordings. Now these microphones pick up most of the sound that I want for most of my instruments, but I would like to eventually one day own a large condenser so I can pick up more low end because these microphones don't pick up that much bass. But really good for the price, I got the pair for $99. I'm sure in the US you can get them for like 60 bucks. They're really, really cheap and they sound really good. Behringer is a company that is German, but they make these products in China, so they're a lot cheaper. So they're good for people like me who are on a budget. And I'm sure if you're watching this, you're probably on a budget as well. So definitely keep a lookout for these. They even come with a case. It also comes with an XY stand, more on that later, and some muffs, yeah really good package for just $99. The reason why you need a pair of these is because you want stereo sound. Just one of these would probably be fine, but it would kind of sound, yeah. Now this is the C2. You can see that there's a little switch here that has like a couple of lines. One is a high pass filter, one is a normal, and one is a minus 10 dB, which makes it softer. I don't usually use any of these. I just keep it on the normal one. Now you might notice on the top here, above where it says C2, it has this little mushroom shape. What is that? So microphones have different patterns in which they record in, and this one uses what they call a cardioid pattern. Now cardioid, cardio, cardio means heart. It's in the shape of a heart, which is kind of like, Woo! So if this is the top of the microphone, it sort of comes out like a big balloon. It's gonna catch everything in front of the microphone in this big balloon shape. Which is good because it means it's a pretty wide field of recording and it doesn't pick up any sound from behind the microphone. So you're less likely to get sounds of like clicking or like cars driving past or whatever. This only records whatever's in front of it. More on that later on in the mic placement section of this video, but two of these and you're set. Now the reason why I didn't suggest buying three microphones, that is two smalls and one large, is because of the third thing that you have to consider, which is your audio interface. Now most of you guys who will be recording will be uploading it to somewhere online, or you'd like to have it on your computer to share. Now you could plug these microphones into something like a Zoom recorder, which has like XLR inputs on it, but Zoom recorders aren't very reliable in the sense that they run on batteries, not a very good way of recording. So the best thing to do is to use an audio interface. An audio interface is the box that can connects your microphones and your computer. So it takes the analog sound of your microphones, it turns it into digital sound and it puts it into your computer so that you can record it, save it, whatever. I remember how I said condenser microphones don't have power, so they need power. Well, the audio interface gives them that power. Now this is the audio interface that I use. It's called the Focusrite Scarlett 2i4. It's a very popular audio interface. Now a lot of computers have USB ports, so this audio interface connects via USB. You can get interfaces that connect by Firewire or Thunderbolt, but that's all very fast. I think USB is the safest bet for most people. This is a pretty cheap interface. I think in the States this costs about $80. It's a really nice one. It's got this really cool red color. I love red. Anyway, what did all of these things do? Well, you can see here there are two XLR inputs. This is the most important thing you need to consider when you buy an audio interface because this determines how many microphones you can put into your audio interface. So because I only have two, that means I can only have two microphones running at any one time. A lot of companies like Focusrite, they'll say stuff like, oh, this is the focus 
writes Scarlet 18i20 and it has 18 inputs but it really only has like six XLR inputs. So these XLR inputs, this is the most important thing because it's gonna determine how many condenser microphones you can have at one time. These knobs here control the gain of the microphones, which is how loud they are. So if you wanna make it louder, you just turn the gain up. You can switch this between line or instrument, which gives it some extra boost. If you plug in something like a guitar, you can also plug guitars into this, but we don't play guitar. There's a pad button, which in extreme circumstances, if you need to make it softer, if you need to make it minus 10, the pad button is good for really loud cracking stuff like snare drum or cymbals or whatever. This button that says 48V is the most important button because without it, there's no power to your microphones. This is called phantom power. It gives power to your microphones and it makes them work essentially. So you press this and your microphones are on. This knob here lets you listen to what's coming through this box on headphones. If you put it this way, it's the sound that's coming in through your microphones. If you put it this way, it's the sound that's going through your computer. Pretty easy. No one cares about this switch. This knob is if you have monitors plugged into the back. So if you have like fancy studio monitors plugged into the back, this big knob controls the volume of that. This is your headphone jack and your headphone volume. This lets you listen to what you're recording so you know that you're recording something good. And then on the back, we have MIDI out and in. If you wanna plug in MIDI stuff, I don't really dabble with that. That's kind of weird to me. <laughs> you have a Kensington lock if you wanna lock this to the table. I don't really use that. And you've got all of these outputs here if you wanna plug in speakers or whatever. But you need one of these to get sound to your computer and however many inputs you have determines how many microphones you can buy. So my recommendation, start small and then you can buy more later on. Okay, so you've chosen your acoustic, you've chosen your microphones, you've bought an audio interface, and now you have to decide mic placement. Mic placement is one of the most hotly debated things about marimba. It's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? Whenever anyone asks, where should I place microphones on the marimba to get the best sound, you'll get like a hundred different answers from a hundred different people. It's always gonna be different, but I'm gonna tell you my way, and if you like it, use it. If not, try something else. Now for me, there are two main ways to record a marimba using two condenser mics. You don't really have many options, so I think these are the two best ways. The first way is called a spaced pair. This is my preferred way of recording a marimba. Most of my sound tests are done using a spaced pair. And just like the name suggests, you get your two condenser microphones, you put them on stands, you make the stands really high, and then you put them on either end of the marimba facing downwards. Now remember how I said there was the cardioid pattern, which is this balloon shaped pattern? Well, what this basically does, it does this sort of Venn diagram thing where you have two cardioid patterns that intersect each other in the middle. Now, a lot of people are gonna say, oh Adam, doesn't that mean you're gonna get phasing distortion because the two fields intersect in the middle? I actually kind of like that. It's just me personally, but I really like having that center sound. So when I have these microphones on the space pair, I'll usually put one microphone on the right channel and one microphone on the left channel so that when you listen to it, it's like this really nice stereo image and it sounds like the marimba's right in front of you. I really aim to get the best quality possible so that you guys can hear mallets really clearly. And you can really play with this setup. Like, you can place the microphones further apart, closer together, point them outwards, point them inwards. One thing that is important is that you shouldn't have the microphones too close to the marimba because then you get a lot of mallet sound and you don't get enough of the resonance that comes from the room and from the resonators and from just the marimba in general. So the closer the microphones are to the marimba, the more bar sound you get. The further away they are, the more room sound you get. Does that make sense? Wow, so many motorcycles here today. Definitely aim for somewhere in between really high and really low, but if it's too high, it's gonna sound really wish-washy, and if it's too low, it's gonna be like I usually put my microphones a bit lower so that you can actually hear the mallet sound because I'm testing mallets after all, so you wanna hear more of that but yeah, definitely personal preference with the space pair. Choose your favorite distance and just experiment. The other way of doing two condenser microphones is through what I call an XY coincident pair. Now, if you buy these Behringer C2s, I'm not sponsored by Behringer. If you buy these Behringer C2s, you'll get one of these things, which lets you put it on a stand and it lets you put two microphones on the one stand. And you're gonna put your two microphones on the stand and you're gonna angle them inwards so that they overlap. One is on top of the other and one points this way and one points this way. This is called an XY coincident pair. If you imagine the patterns that come out of the XY pair, one will go this way and one will go this way. So you'll have a very, very slight intersect, but not much, not as much as the space pair. The downside is that you can't adjust it as much. You obviously can't angle the microphones or make them as close as you could before with the space pair. So there's a little bit less wiggle room, but it definitely takes up a lot less space because you would put this setup right in the middle of the marimba and that would be it. Now that's all well and good for two microphones. What happens if you have three? One setup that is used by Vic Firth, I believe is a spaced pair with the large condenser microphone on the floor. So you'd have the two small condenser 
spaces up on the overhead pointing downwards and then you'd have the large condenser on the floor or very very low down in the middle of the marimba. So that large condenser microphone on the floor picks up the lower end sound and the two smaller microphones pick up the higher end sound. Then you mix them together and you get this really nice well-rounded marimba sound. But I'm not rich, I can't afford three microphones so maybe next time. <laughs> so you've chosen your acoustic, you've chosen your microphones, you've chosen your audio interface, you've chosen your mic placement, and now finally it's the software. Now software that we use for recording audio, we usually call it a DAW, which stands for Digital Audio Workstation. There's a lot of DAWs out there. You have like Ableton, you have FL Studio, you have Logic Pro, you have Cubase, all kinds of software but I think the best thing to do with recording stuff like this is to keep it simple. After all, you're not gonna be putting like 70 effects and doing like side chains and stuff, so just keep it really simple. I usually use Logic Pro X because I have it, but if you can't afford to pay for Logic Pro, go for something like Audacity. Audacity is a really good piece of free software that just lets you do the basics, and that will be good enough for most people. I like to put my microphone inputs on separate tracks so that when they record, I can play with the channels and make the right side louder, the left side louder, etc, etc. But when I record mallet reviews or mallet sound tests, I don't really put any effects, I don't put equalizers, I don't put reverbs. What what you hear in the video is generally just clean, normal sound. The only effect I use on my sound clips is a compressor. A compressor basically takes the loudest sound and the softest sound of your recording and compresses it together so that the entire clip sounds louder as a whole. It means you don't get as much dynamic contrast, but it also means you can hear it much clearer. And I personally like that, you may not like that, so experiment. Once you've got those five things, you're ready to record. But yeah, the total cost of my recording setup, 300 bucks, it's not very much for something that you can use over and over and over again. It's a lot cheaper to just buy this once instead of always hiring someone to record for you. I always like doing things myself, so yeah. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and please let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see more videos like this. If you'd like to see a video about how to record video, I can also do that. If you have any other suggestions, let me know in the comments below and please remember to hit that red subscribe button if you haven't already to keep up with my uploads. We're very close to 2,000 subscribers. That was quick. Thank you so much for the support. Once again, if you want to buy these hoodies, you know where to find them in the description below. And I make videos every week for you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next week for another episode of The Studio. Good night.